Let's get started. Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar, Sustainable, Invest Sustainable Energy Investments from Sun to Wheel. Wider adoption of electric vehicles is on its way in the UK. The government has proposed a ban on petrol, diesel, and even hybrids within the next 15 years. Now, I can remember when it was a little exciting to see a Prius drive by, let alone a Tesla. But now every major automaker is either producing their own electric vehicle or getting to produce one in the very near future. A new type of car calls for a new type of infrastructure to keep it on the road. Right now, electric cars that are charged in homes or on publicly available chargers are largely powered by fossil fuels. So driving one is still carbon heavy and doesn't bring the UK that much closer to its climate goals. Not to mention there aren't nearly enough charging points to go around for the number of electric vehicles that we'll be needing soon. As a matter of fact, earlier this week, I was walking near my home in central London and I nearly tripped over a cable that was lying there. I looked up and saw that some bright spark had daisy chained a bunch of extension leads together and rigged them out of a second story window, down the side of an apartment block, across the pavement, and then into his electric car, a Nissan Leaf. I suppose that's one solution, but it's probably not going to be the solution. We have a much better one to discuss today with the PLSA's newest education partner, GridServe, a provider of net zero carbon sustainable energy and transport infrastructure. Today, we're going to hear from Toddington Harper, Chief Executive, and his colleague, Mark Henderson, their Chief Investment Officer. They'll tell us all about this new infrastructure category, how it works, exciting projects that are already underway, and importantly, how this investment can fit in a pension fund portfolio, and explain this very intriguing idea of sun to wheel. My name is Rachel Pine, and I look after content for the PLSA's events and training. I'll be chairing today's session. Now I'm gonna start by asking you a polling question. There are a few throughout the broadcast, but the first one's going to pop up on your screen in a moment. So the first question is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed your appetite for investing in sustainable energy infrastructure? Less important now, hasn't changed, more important, or something else? As you can see, very interesting. So it hasn't changed or it's more important now for the vast majority of people listening today, which is a very good place to introduce Toddington Harper. Hi everybody. Um, just taking uh, control of the screen. Perfect. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Toddington. Really, you know, good morning to everybody. Uh, on this very sunny day, really delighted to be um, to be hosting this this webinar today um, and, and talking to you all about sustainable energy, um, some of the activities that we're involved with, and, and really uh, discussing opportunities um, for, for you all to potentially uh, 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 get involved in, in in delivering this 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 agenda as well. So we've got a, a full agenda. So I'm gonna I'm gonna push through and really start with um, you know really what is this all about. Um, I, I never really thought that I would, uh, I would start a, a presentation with a quote from, from um, the CEO of, of one of the largest oil companies in the world. Um, but very interestingly, this is one of the largest oil companies in the world that has uh, decided that they're going to become a net zero company. Um, and as, as the chief executive has written here, because the world's carbon budget is finite, it's running out fast, and we need a rapid transition to net zero. Um, words I think a lot of us probably wouldn't have expected only a few years ago. Um, but but what, is it, what does it really mean? You know, what is this net zero? What is this carbon budget? How can you kind of put it into, into perspective? Um, and so I thought I'd share with you a couple, of, a couple of slides, a couple of pictures on the right that illustrate really what the challenge is that we're facing. Um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, have done a study, or many studies, and, and the world's leading scientists agree that to maintain temperatures within one and a half degrees, there's only a certain amount of carbon that can be emitted, um, and more can be emitted to keep temperatures within, within two degrees. But, you know, really quite a, um, a concerning factor is that that budget positions based on current trajectory of carbon emissions, um, we're going to breach that one and a half degrees budget um, with only in, in only around seven and a half years. Um, that's seven and a half years from now based on our current trajectory. Um, maintaining carbon emissions at, uh, at two, uh, maintaining temperatures at two degrees, we, we have a bit longer, we have up to 25 years. 
Um, but of course, you know, the whole point about this is, is we don't have seven and a half years or 25 years. The, the point is we, we, we never want to breach those carbon budgets. Uh, we must reduce emissions very quickly uh, in order to, uh, in order to um, push this, this, this agenda out further and further till we have, no, we have a net zero position and we're not contributing further to these challenges because as we are you know, increasingly aware, there's huge, huge impacts, um, environmental and also financial, uh, to be expected from from you know more aggressive climate change which is going to clearly be upon us if we don't really kind of move the needle now and and, and make a significant change um so you know what is the world doing um to, to to really make this happen the paris agreement um effectively the world's leading um leading economies countries have agreed to keep emissions below two degrees and aspirationally to one and a half degrees, there is a very significant difference. Um, one and a half degrees of warming to two degrees, it doesn't seem like that, but you know, the impact on, for example, the world's coral reefs um, it would be very, very significant. Um, the difference between a one and a half degrees impact and a two degrees impact. Um, in the UK, the legislation that we have that's driving the whole agenda is the Climate Change Act. Um, we have, as a company now, as a country, sorry, committed to uh, eradicating our emissions and it from a net zero perspective with only thir within only 30 years from now um, which is uh, which is you know, really really quite a timeline and in addition to that and as Rachel proposed the government has mentioned um, banning diesel proposed banning diesel petrol and hybrid cars within only 15 years from now so if you kind of like look at that as the backdrop of, of, of really what we're talking about today plus the fact that one and a half degrees really is only seven and a half years away from now it's really, really important that people recognize that, you know, this is, this is on our watch. This is for us to do, you know, not just organizations, but well, all of us on this call and those aren't on this call. You know, we, we don't have time to outsource this challenge to future generations. If it's going to get solved and we must solve it, it's down to us collectively to make this happen. Um, we as an organization, GridServe, are, are really doing everything we possibly can to, uh, to, to drive the transition to net zero. Um, we uh, are an integrated company, so we finance projects typically till they're constructed. We do entire development, so we create projects from scratch. Um, we are the, the, the contractors, the EPC contractor, which means we build them out. And thereafter, we operate, maintain and manage them for their lifetime. Uh, and our focus is really about sustainable energy and transport infrastructure. Uh, as an organization, you know, we delivered more solar energy than anyone else in the UK last year, but, but it's still far away from what we need to achieve. Um, and so, you know, really exciting about, excited to be here talking to you today because, you know, organizations like ours, you know, really have the ability and we have the solutions to deliver what's necessary, but only if the funding is there to support it. So it's, it's really exciting to kind of bring, be bringing these worlds together uh, as much as possible. And we certainly collectively for our, our collective benefit all need that. Um, and uh, as well, useful to share that we also have a strategic relationship with Hitachi Capital and that's allowed us to very much accelerate our efforts. Um, we talk a lot now about an, an ecosystem called the sun to wheel, um, sun to wheel infrastructure. Uh, what does that actually mean? Um, for those who've kind of studied the oil industry, you'd be very familiar with a term called well to wheel, um, you know, taking energy out of, uh, out of oil wells, processing it in refineries, distributing it to different countries, putting it in, uh, in, in containers and so on, and ending up at, at petrol forecourts or power stations. Um, now, the really, you know, enormous factor to I guess take on board that you know when it comes to net zero, oil wells, refineries, fossil fuel power stations, and petrol forecourts, you know, from the context of providing energy, um, really don't have a place in in net zero. So they don't have um, a place in you know in the future between now and the next thirty years if we're going to meet these challenges. And and that's why organisations like BP uh, and really I, I think it's fair to say across the board are really grasping the nettle now. And, and we can see significant changes already that are happening as a result. BP recently wrote off 40 billion pounds of assets that would otherwise have been stranded um, in a net zero situation. Um, and you know, we, we, you know, runways aren't being approved if they don't consider climate change. And so effectively all major decisions now are being judged against this, uh, this um, consideration of, of, of meeting net zero. So, you know, so if we're not gonna have oil wells, refineries, fossil fuel power stations and petrol forecourts, what are we gonna have? And you know, really excited to share um, share our, our our views on this. I, I think it's fair to say that we're pretty well qualified to represent those views because we, at least as an organisation, are delivering all of this infrastructure. There's nothing speculative. We're talking to you about. We're delivering it all. We're delivering it now, and we're we're starting to really deliver it at scale. 
and, and clearly there's opportunities, you know, to work together to, to really to really do this as, you know, as a combined effort, which is the only way it's ever really going to happen. So the, the, the first part of it, the kind of equivalent of your oil well is your, is your, is your solar farm that harvests the energy. People probably don't really think about it too much, but um, the energy in oil is actually stored sunlight from, you know, 300 million years ago or, 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 or thereabouts. Um, and that used to be very plentiful, very cheap, um, but it's no longer plentiful and no longer so cheap. Um, and, uh, and, you know, what, what we're able to do with solar farms is to capture that energy um, and use it today at a, at a lower cost, really, than extracting it from the ground. And, that, and that's a fundamental difference um, from where it has been. I'm sure a lot of you have invested in, uh, in solar projects and are quite happy with the steady revenues that they bring. Uh, and, and in the future, there's going to be an awful lot more of this. I guess one of the major differences is that rather than just producing solar energy projects, which get subsidized um, from the government, because previously the costs were, uh, were too high to make the economics work an, uh, another way, you know, what we and others are doing, and certainly what the future is, is all about, is bringing that solar technology with other technologies, such as batteries, battery energy storage, that allows you to store that energy and therefore make it usable and, you know, where it has greatest value. So, you know, days like today where it's extremely sunny, there's a lot of energy produced. Um, now, the price of energy is very likely to reduce. But if you have a battery, you can store that energy and you can push it out later at night, for example, when you might have all your air conditioners on and, and so on and so forth, trying to, trying to cool the place down. So that's a really, really important part. I think the other thing to realize about batteries is that when you have a battery, you're not just providing any, a, a service to, to, to shift solar energy or other forms of renewable energy. You actually also can provide a service to the grid to, uh, to help support the grid um, and actually manage the supply and demand on the grid itself. And there's a significant opportunity uh, there as well. Um, for balancing the grid as well. So you can make multiple income streams um, when you combine other solutions such as, such as batteries. But the way, it, the way it works, how you're able to do that is that what effectively the battery does is it can simulate any service that the grid uh, effectively offers. And what that means is that in addition to just pro providing energy to the grid, you can also provide energy to other locations directly connected uh, to your battery without actually having to go through the grid at all. Uh, and this is, um, and, and as you can see an example here, you can take solar energy um, from, from, you know, harness it from the sun, you can store it in a battery, and you can put that energy directly into electric vehicles as an example. And every kilowatt hour that you put into an electric vehicle allows that electric vehicle to go around, you know, let's say on average of four, four miles per kilowatt hour. And that's a really significant step up in value. It also means some of the issues that you would have otherwise in court, you know, uh, otherwise factored in of, of causing issues to the grid from additional requirements for battery charging, you can also, uh, you can also min minimize as well. In addition to that, you can provide um, you know, other applications as well. A very exciting opportunity we're working on is the combination of both solar farms and also vertical farms um, that allow us to produce huge amounts of, of uh, you know, significant um, crop production, but also in a net zero manner and actually significantly more efficient than conventional agricultural methods too. So there's a diversity in here as well. Um, and, and of course, you can't do all of that on every location, so it's very important to also pump energy into the grid. And that energy can be used both to, uh, to supply through, through, through specialist power purchase contracts, um, charging infrastructure in wherever location that it might be, um, and also other entities and organizations. If, if you want to kind of, you know, to green your energy supply, you can contract green energy and you can do it directly through these type of structures. Anyway, that kind of whole ecosystem is what we call sun to wheel. Uh, and as I said, that is the infrastructure that we are currently developing today. So kind of what does it look like? Um, we thought a good example of this was to really show you uh, a project um, that we've delivered last year that captures both the sun uh, and, the, and the battery components of that. Okay, so this is, um, this is a project that, uh, that it's set in a field. It's a 200 acre site in York. Many of you um, would think, what do you, you know, does it really make sense to build a solar project in York? Um, you know, you can, we actually produce a huge amount of energy. I think many of you would be surprised that we can produce the equivalent energy for, for over 20,000 electric vehicles for the next 30 years. So net zero vehicle motoring for 20,000 vehicles from this project alone. Um, you know, we can supply around 13,000 houses. Uh, and actually, because there are a large number of batteries that you've seen in the containers, as well as significant amount of solar panels, um, it means you can shift that energy to stabilize the grid um, and, uh, and 
uh, and, and you know, ensure that that energy is as valuable as possible. As I said previously, this, this, this brings additional revenue diversity. So I guess what you lose in the world of, of subsidies, because I think people were used to subsidies um, you know, that, that provide certain income, um, the future is not about subsidies because we don't need them anymore. What we have in return is actually real value, um, which, we, uh, which we can deliver. Um, you know, i.e. the value of having an operating grid, the value of, of actually running your businesses, your homes and so on on, no, on, on, on net zero uh, carbon energy. And, and actually that additional real value more than makes up for what we lost in the, at the end of the subsidy era. And the other advantage about that is that it, it means we can also deliver, uh, deliver at scale. Um, because, you know, when you have a subsidized environment, it's quite a, a difficult place to do business. The world is always changing. Um, uh, you know, MPs might have different opinions on subsidies and reductions, whereas the world we're in now, which fortunately the subsidy era enabled us to, um, to kind of get to, because organizations like ours and others worked out how to build projects like this at scale and at pace, meant that we don't need this anymore. We can outcompete pretty much any other renewable, any other energy technology. I guess we're on a par with wind. And also useful to, um, useful to also, I guess, confirm and align with people. That, uh, that we don't see wind as in any way as, as a competition. It, it's a both and scenario. And actually, you know, uh, the powers that be gave us a, a perfect solution that on very sunny days like this, you don't have so much wind. And on very windy days, you typically don't have so much sun. Typically in the winter, you have a lot more wind and in the summer, you have a lot more sun. And actually the two balance out incredibly well. Um, and so really that's an example of what can be achieved in a, in, in a relatively small amount of time. Um, you know, and by uh, an organization like ours and, and, and of course others. Um, but, you know, I mentioned 200 acres of land and I think a, a few of you are probably thinking, my goodness, you know, is that really a good idea? Um, but I think it's also useful to highlight the other enormous challenge that we are facing, which is that according to the World, 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 World Wildlife Fund for Nature, um, humans have lost um, around 60% of the world's wildlife um, in the last in the last you know, 40, 50 years, really shocking. Over 60% of the world's wildlife, which means we've got around 40% left. And if we've lost 60% in the last 40 years, in the next 40 years, um, it's really down to us collectively um, to, to do something about that. So, you know, again, it's, it's important to share as well, that, and as well as mitigating climate change, which is on our watch collectively, it's also on our watch to preserve and protect species for you know, ours and, and future generations as well, because if we don't really, you know, it, it's going to go the way of the dodo and that would be, that would be terrible. So you know, the advantage of projects like, like solar farms is that we can take these huge expanses of, expanses of land, we can give them back to nature, we can turn them into nature sanctuaries, we can use these nature sanctuaries to support education awareness, uh, and as I mentioned previously, we can also connect vertical farms so we can grow and actually we can grow significantly more efficiently um, from the same area of land doing both and all of this together. And we think that's really important. And these pictures just illustrate some of the examples of initiatives that we as an organization uh, and, and people within our company have delivered before. So just before I kind of, you know, jump onto the next piece, the kind of electric vehicle uh, charging piece, I, I guess the, 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 the wheel of the sun to wheel, um, thinking we wanted to, to raise another poll, you know, based on the kind of infrastructure you've just looked at what we're talking about. We're, we're really keen to understand what are the, 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 some of the types of ways that you may be interested in, in, in investing, you know, what are the most suitable opportunities um, in, in, in this regard? Great. So thanks, Tynton. So I'm just asking everyone, what is your preferred method of investing into sustainable infrastructure? Green bonds, infrastructure funds, unit trusts, not yet investing in sustainable infrastructure or something else. And as you can see, so infrastructure funds are the preferred method of this group, followed by not yet investing, green bonds and unit trusts. So I think that will bring you into your next portion very nicely. Yeah, that's incredibly interesting. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, us and others, you know, we, um, you know, we're really at the, um, you can't use the word cold face anymore. It doesn't really make sense in this, in this world, but you know, the, the equivalent of that, you know, we are, um, you know, really kind of, you know, at the forefront of creating and driving this infrastructure forward. Um, and what we're trying to work out is how best to, you know, to structure this type of infrastructure with the audience, um, with, with, with the right, you know, people who are looking to invest in that. And so that's why we're looking for, you know, answers to, you know, what are the best solutions that you guys would be looking for to, so we can collectively achieve the maximum impact. Um, so hopefully this slide also demonstrates some, you know, <laughs> what, what's coming. 
and, and when I say what's coming, I don't really mean what's coming, you know, in a few years from now, but I mean, you know, what's coming really around the corner and what's already here. So I, I, I think it's fair to say that 2021, it was probably going to be 2020, but 2021 is going to be the year that electric vehicles start becoming mainstream. Um, it, it's fair to say that because as you can see here, every major auto manufacturer essentially in the world has a plug-in or fully electric um, vehicle or, or actually more likely a combination, a whole family of plug-in and fully electric vehicles, you know, and many organizations themselves, uh, many car companies have, have now made the transition and commitment to go to pure electric, uh, including, the, you know, including Daimler, the creator of the, of the combustion engine, which is quite remarkable. And so as of next year, um, as you can see by this graph from all of the major autos, you know, we're no longer, longer talking about, you know, Tesla uh, or just a few models of EVs. We're talking about over 200 types of models of, of, of vehicles commercially available um, at costs that make absolute economic sense. Um, and particularly if you run these projects on the type of infrastructure that we've just explained can deliver very, very substantial benefits because we're certainly not running them off coal. We're running them off net zero solutions um, and, and so on. Um, and, and really, you know, whilst I guess from my perspective and our perspective, we think that, you know, the, the government steer and I guess the whole uh, IPCC steer and the, in the UN, the Paris Agreement and so on um, uh, has kind of, you know, has created, if you like, the incentive and the demand and, 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 and the government's legislation is, is, is the stick that you must achieve this by this data, it's going to be banned. Personally, we think that um, that actually the uptake in electric vehicles is going to happen probably a lot sooner. Uh, and we think it's going to happen, not because people are forced to, but because people want to. We, we really feel that we're very, very close to that kind of mobile, like Nokia phone mobile effect that, you know, there was a period where that was all there was. And then really in a very short space of time, something new was created that was just significantly better in so many ways, i.e. the iPhone. And then consumers thereafter just didn't want to buy any more of the previous products. And we, we see that happening with... Um, with, uh, with electric vehicles in a, in, a, in a very substantial way, you know, and, and really two of the, the significant challenges that are holding this back now, uh, both have been relating to cost, which is, you know, either already on a par, certainly in life cycle terms, um, already a par or less expensive now. Um, and and in, in addition to that, concerns around charging. So, um, you know, for those who have electric vehicles or those that don't, you'll know that you don't just have to charge them in one location, you can charge them in a number of locations. Home charging is, um, is one of those, but as Rachel alluded to, you know, 30 or 40% of people who, uh, you know, don't have that option at all as an option and actually putting cables across the streets of London probably isn't a very good solution either. If councils can get in trouble for, um, for having pavements that are, you know, half an inch higher than a paving stone, half an inch higher than another one, I'm not sure what's going to happen when there's, if there were to be thousands and thousands of kind of trip ropes across the, uh, across London. Um, but of course, you know, home charging is a part of the solution. Destination charging is another part, i.e. if you're in a destination like workplace or a car park and, uh, and there happens to be a charge, you want to match that to the location. But in addition to all of that, people really need robust charging infrastructure that really gives people the same level of confidence that they get today from, from a petrol station um, uh, and, and so on. And, and I guess the, um, I guess the, the key message to, to demonstrate to you is that infrastructure is, is coming very, very quickly. Um, and to uh, really illustrate that, um, Rebecca is going to share with us a video. So you'll be able to get a link to the video um, uh, will be shared after the presentation as well. When I say this is coming very quickly, um, again, I think it's fair that I can speak on pretty good authority um, because we as an organization are building this. In fact, we are building exactly this. Um, this project will be, it's about 65% through. It would have already been completed by now if it wasn't for the, for the pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, and, you know, we as an organization, and there are clearly others as well, are looking to roll out an entire network of public charging solutions like this over the course of the next five years, you know, that will really give people the absolute confidence. So there's 24 charges here. You can charge a vehicle in, you know, 20 minutes or 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and, you know, if you've got 24 charges, you're, not, you're certainly not going to be waiting more than a few minutes um, to be able to turn up and charge. Um, the, all of the energy, there's a solar canopy, but all of the energy is produced um, by additional solar farms, as I mentioned, either directly connected to projects or sleeved contractually. Um, in addition to that, this is, we're building, um, building new buildings as well. Uh, and these form two functions. One function is very same as you would get in a, in a, in a petrol forecourt, but the major difference between a petrol forecourt and a, 
electric forecourt is that uh, in an electric forecourt, you're going to be there 20 or 30 minutes. You have to really accommodate for that audience to be able to find somewhere to relax, to have a coffee, uh, to be able to have something decent to eat uh, and so on and so forth. But we also recognize that, you know, one of the things that's holding people back is access to information. And so a big part of this as well is to use this as, these as an opportunity to help educate people about what are the different types of electric vehicles, allow people to do test drives and so on and so forth. Because as soon as people have experienced this infrastructure, as soon as people have taken a ride in an electric vehicle, they, 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 they genuinely or typically um, wouldn't want any alternative because the vehicles themselves are absolutely fantastic. I certainly haven't met anybody that said that they tried an electric vehicle, they had one and they, did, and they wanted to go back to a combustion engine. And I think it's also very clear that, you know, very large swathes of the population are, are, are very interested, um, you know, in making this transition, but certainly don't yet have the confidence. And when people start seeing infrastructure like this being deployed at scale, when people recognize that actually they don't need to worry anymore, because this infrastructure just enables people to charge, you know, without any anxiety. In fact, it's a much better experience than people were previously looking, you know, previously expecting. I don't think anyone probably really thinks about a petrol a petrol forecourt as a great experience, um, but certainly that is the objective that we and others in this space are, are certainly looking to achieve. This site will be in operation uh, in Q4 2020, um, and um, you know, delighted uh, to to talk more about this to anybody who who, who would certainly like to know. Um, in addition to this, in addition to what you've seen, the kind of retail building and the charging, we also have very large batteries, and these batteries are providing additional. Um, additional uh, revenue streams as well, and also supporting the grid. When we, when, when we started on this venture, it wasn't as clear cut when the EV transition was coming. So we worked on integrating additional revenue streams, which are quite important. Um, now that hasn't got such an impact, but it, it's certainly very important. And we also have, uh, have charges, you can probably see on the right hand side from another, uh, another well known, probably the most well known EV charging provider. Kind of before I step off and, and hand you over to Mark, I just thought I would also show, um, you know, give you guys a glimpse of what else is, uh, what we all, uh, um, a glimpse of what else is coming. So to give you an example, this is actually another project. It's another project that is now in planning permission. No one apart from you and, and in our team have seen this yet. Um, this really demonstrates the entire sun to wheel ecosystem. So we're building not just an electric forecourt, but also an entirely new solar farm. Um, so the solar farm in the background, think of that as your oil well, the batteries here, think of it as your, as your refinery, the electric forecourt itself uh, is there, and, and all the needs of the EV charging as well. So, you know, hopefully that kind of demonstrates to you that, you know, this is, um, this is infrastructure which is coming very, very quickly, and this is infrastructure which really does stand up to, you know, the task and the responsibility, really, of taking over from, uh, from the infrastructure that has sustained our, our economies and, and just driven you know, such incredible uh, in growth over the last however many decades. So just to hand you over to, to Mark now to talk more about the kind of underlying uh, opportunities about investing in this sort of infrastructure. Good morning. Um, thank you for that handover, Paddington. Um, there are many ways to invest in, in this new sustainable infrastructure um, and there's going to be a, probably such a high degree of investments that there's room for all these different uh, structures and um, debt products and equity products as well. But today I want to just focus in on green bonds because this has become a very hot topic um, and is attracting a lot of interest and in some cases a bit of um, uh, debate as well in terms of what is green and, and how do you go about deciding what is a green bond and what is not. Um, one interesting fact is that even though this is due to be a, a relatively new area, uh, in 2019, uh, the green bond market passed the $100 billion mark. So that's probably a drop in the ocean compared to, to the amount of funds that uh, is on this call, for example. But that's still a pretty sizable amount, and it's only increasing exponentially in size. So... There are many different ways to, to invest um, and say so the green bond, I think, spans a couple of areas. Um, I'm just trying to get control of the screen. There we go. Um, the PLSA actually issued a guide on private market investment last year, which they wrote with um, BlackRock, wasn't it? And they 
highlighted two areas in particular. One was infrastructure debt, and one was renewable income. And I think this very neatly spans and combines both those areas. So why should people consider this? Uh, well, if you're putting together your portfolio, um, I don't want to, to uh, teach you how to suck eggs, but clearly there are uh, some very strong factors here. Uh, as we're seeing with current market uh, volatility and uh, changes, particularly in the equity market, um, the infrastructure world, particularly the, the critical infrastructure world, which this is a part of, really continues in a very smooth manner and rides a lot of these bumps in the markets that come along because the assets produce their own cash and they are, or they will be affected to some extent by the, uh, the outside world movements. It does allow you to have a very predictable and regular cash revenue stream. Uh, the fact that it's also an area of, of high impact and certainly satisfies all the criteria for being an ESG asset, um, which is an area of, of very high demand at the moment, is certainly a, a bonus. Um, the level of investment is again, I think an attractive one. I mean, the 10 year guilt I've got here, I printed this off from the FT a few days ago, but I mean, it shows very clearly that the guilts in, uh, have been below 2% for five years. Um, now, you may also say that's fine, but if you're getting a higher return, what's the risk level? And uh, I'm pleased to say that because these assets are or the bonds are secured on um, tangible uh, secured assets, which allows you a first uh, priority in the cash flow, it gives you a much better risk return profile. Um, Moody's and Standard Poor's have uh, provided studies on the infrastructure asset class, um, showing that over the course of their lifetime, they actually improve in terms of their reliability, such that a a triple B rated asset can graduate to an A grade over time. Clearly, it depends on the asset class, although, as we're talking here about solar, which is a very, very predictable asset class with very few moving parts, it's uh, certainly one of the stronger asset levels. Uh, and another fact, of course, it provides a lot of diversification within your portfolios. Um, and it's a diversification which I think a lot of people are welcoming. Uh, you've probably heard the, the phrase that's been banded around a lot during the lockdown period of build back better. I think if there's one positive, there's not many of them, but if there's one positive out of this pandemic, it is that there is, seems to be a, a realisation now is a great chance to, to reboot, restructure and uh, create infrastructure which is clean, sustainable and environmentally friendly going forward. Just last week, Alok Sharma, the UK Business Secretary, and actually the, the president of COP26, if it does go ahead, he affirmed the UK government's commitment to build back better and actually commented that they, their intention is to deliver a green recovery in partnership with business and finance. This very much is uh, of the moment. Um, I say it's of the moment, but well, what is a green bond? Well, it actually covers about uh, a considerable amount of moments as it uh, can be a very long, um, long term. There are many different categories, but in general terms, what I'm picking out here is the features that would be applicable to really all green bonds. Firstly, the, the proceeds of the bonds should be applied to uh, the actual green projects. Um, what is deemed to be green is, is very clear. There's plenty of uh, green bond principles from uh, ECMA, um, there are independent verification firms um, who will accredit and verify that projects are not only green, but they fit in with green bond principles, the Climate Bonds Initiative as well. Typically, if a corporate issues a green bond, then the money goes into a project and whilst it's to be held uh, and used for those specific purposes, in a more project related green bond, which is what we're looking at here, the assets, the project assets themselves, are held in their own special purpose vehicle. And that allows them to be ring fenced and solvency remote from the rest of the company. Um, and it's very clear focus, which gives transparency to the cash flows and it gives clear security over the assets. Uh, in setting out 
um, what uh, the benefits of these assets are, then it's quite typical to look at the uh, UN's Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. There are seven of these, and I've picked out here um, a number which actually apply to the projects that we work on. Everything from providing affordable and clean energy to creating clean, environmentally friendly infrastructure, it helps the communities and building those climate action. It goes all the way through to quality education. Um, as you see, we engage with the local communities and schools and host them on our site and uh, really get them very involved in our projects. The last feature of a green bond is that there's also, very importantly, metrics set out as to what, uh, what these projects will achieve, whether it is tons of carbon dioxide avoided, whether it is creating extra uh, green areas. Um, and so whatever these metrics are, these should be monitored and reported on, and there should be annual reports as well, uh, verifying these areas. At this point, let me just pause um, because we're going to go into a specific uh, look at a, a green bond, but um, we've got a couple of polls actually this time. So Rachel, if I can hand them over to you to look at the potential appetite uh, that people have for the terms and returns of bonds. Very good. So first question, what tenor of green bond is most attractive for you? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years or something else. Very good. And you can see that it looks like the largest number here, like the 10 year bond. Um, and now for the next question, the next question is, what is the minimum hurdle rate? That's the target rate of return for you to invest into green bonds. Two and a half percent, five percent, seven and a half percent or something else. We have a very clear preference here for 5% as the minimum hurdle rate. And I'm going to let you continue, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thank you to everyone uh, uh, for their feedback on those polls. That's very interesting. And it means as I come into this last section, which is the sun to wheel bond. So we've been talking about the sun to wheel concept. And here's uh, an example, a real example of the green bond that we're working on at the moment. Um, which allows you to, to look at uh, how it can work in practice. Um, I'm pleased to say that we did write this slide some time ago, so when you look at uh, some of these numbers, it's not reflecting the, what was said in that uh, um, poll just now. Uh, Grits, you know, we are very, very capital intensive. We are looking to, to um, build over 100 million pounds worth of, of projects over the next 12 months, which we've already got planning permission for, grid connections for, and uh, uh, relevant approvals for. So we're going to be embarking on quite a, an intensive program. And as an example of this, uh, our first bond, um, it's uh, probably a, a, an initial smaller amount uh, of 20 million pounds. But what it's doing here is it's combining uh, uh, the, the two assets that Toddington was talking about to give that integrated upstream downstream um, approach. So we have on the left here the, the Braintree electric forecourt, which will be operating because we, we fund our projects on balance sheets, taking out the construction risk and coming back to the risk return structure. We, we take the construction risk out and we're combining it with an operating hybrid solar project. It always amazes me when uh, I'm speaking to, to people, you get some naysayers, I see this on, on LinkedIn every week, somebody suddenly has a light bulb moment, really an old fashioned light bulb, not an LED light bulb moment. And they go, oh, what was EV charging? Where are they gonna get the power from? You know, it would be fossil fuels, won't it? Well, it doesn't have to be. And this very vividly demonstrates that and the projects will be tied together, selling the, the electricity from the solar projects to the, to the EV charging. Uh, we have the batteries, as Toddington mentioned, which also not only evens out the, the, the strains and the pressures on the grid, but it also allows us to provide 24 hour a day uh, renewable electricity for the project. Um, we think this does take away further risks and allows a lot of comfort around the, the pricing as well. Um, 
the indicative terms on this, uh, we square bracketed the term because we hear that pension funds do like very long terms, 20 years. There's interest in the polls coming out more at 10 years, although there was a smattering of interest at 15 and 5. It's clearly fully secured on the assets, which are in their own SPVs, but it does amortize from year five onwards. And the return, I'm pleased to say, has been pitched at uh, yields plus 5% or 500 basis points. Um, which actually was the 75% the, the, the preferred hurdle rate. So I'm pleased to say we're, we're, we're hitting that. Um, what I also wanted to illustrate though is, is the, coming back to the is the diversity of um, revenues that come out of the project. Uh, a common question people say is, you know, how long is it going to take for EVs to, to, to take off? And if you're building an EV charging station, when is it going to uh, hit the, the, the break-even period? Well, the fact is that we've structured this in such a way that we have this diversity of revenue streams that actually we could have very low and probably even no EV charging at all and still be able to service the, 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 the debt service on the bond because of the extra other revenue streams. Now, obviously, we need people to turn up, but it's very interesting that... Uh, BP have admitted that for their petrol full courts, uh, over 50% of customers who go to those petrol full courts don't buy any petrol. So actually having our electric full courts and uh, having our retail and convenience retail sales as well allows us to, to uh, still be generating, we believe, very strong revenues as well. So that's uh, what the revenue streams look like. It, it combines very nicely, I think, uh, very colorful. Clearly being a bond, it, it doesn't have the equity upside, but it gets a very nice, consistent long-term yield. And I think perhaps at this point, um, we should bring it to a conclusion. Um, if anyone wants to pick up on any of these points, then please feel free to contact either Tonington or myself. These are our details, which will be included in the, uh, the handout. But perhaps now I can go back to Rachel for the Q&A. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Um, and for everyone watching, the um, links to the YouTube videos are in the chat box and we'll be sending them around tomorrow. Um, and please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, quick question. I think it's for Tottington. You mentioned batteries. Um, how are the batteries disposed at the end of their life? Yeah, so there's been a lot of work. In fact, we've done a lot of work into battery recycling as well. Um, so uh, effectively the batteries will be fully recycled at the end of their life, both the ba batteries that we use, so very large, as you've seen, you know, 40 foot containers full of batteries and, uh, and also large batteries in the, in the, in, in the cars themselves or vehicles themselves. Um, the, the, the challenge has really been a commercial one so far that, uh, that, you know, technically it's possible to recycle these batteries with no issue at all, but because there aren't really that many batteries um, haven't been that many batteries around to recycle. These facilities haven't been able to run at full capacity and therefore it's been quite an expensive process actually because the cost of batteries are coming down so much and they've reduced in price by maybe 80% in the last five years rather amazingly. In fact, that's a useful one as well, solar energy. So, so my father was installing solar energy 45 years ago and the cost of that solar energy was 99.5% less expensive than it is today. Uh, sorry, more expensive than it is today. Just, just extraordinary. And the same things happen with batteries. As a result of that, the cost of recycling batteries has been prohibitive. But actually, as we get to much greater volumes of batteries, um, then those fact facilities are allowed to run around the clock and that can allow them to get efficiencies and drive down costs as well. So we're, um, you know, we have no doubt that, uh, that, um, that, that these batteries will be fully recycled. Um, I guess the, the one thing that people do have a bit of doubt is, and I saw a question from uh, Catherine about you know, the, the electric car uh, market, the, the secondhand market, um, you know, one of the, the interesting things that we're finding is that people perceive that the batteries in electric cars would degrade an awful lot more than they have. Uh, and the reason that there aren't so many batteries to be recycled yet is because the degradation is very, very limited in comparison to what people expected. But, you know, you know that said, you know, clearly with the shift to electric vehicles being mainstream and batteries, you know, really becoming a huge part of our whole infrastructure and then there's going to be a lot of batteries and they're going to need recycling but fortunately there's nothing technically that technical that needs to be invented that isn't known yet it's just really about the scale and optimization um, process that needs to needs to work right very good um question here 
this is interesting. Are these ideas consistent with the possibility of a vastly reduced appetite for energy in the new world? For example, reduction of traffic volume and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I think the, um, I think the thing is, is that what we're losing, so we're losing, you know, a huge amount of fossil energy um, and, uh, and we're also losing, um, losing petrol and diesel for driving vehicles. So actually replacing that massive gap with renewable energy is actually, um, it, it kind of works quite well together. Um, because, you know, actually you only want to deploy as much renewable energy as you need to service your requirement. And the requirement is still absolutely enormous. Uh, if you take into account that you are, uh, re you know, you, you're, you know, all this kind of fossil fuel generation is being decreased at the same time. Um, so, you know, really, I guess for certainly for the foreseeable in the transition to net zero, there's a, you know, an, an enormous market, it'd be fair to say, um, for renewable energy and battery solutions. Um, you know, if that means we don't have to produce as much total generating capacity that we, um, that we previously relied on with fossil fuels, I think that's a good thing. Um, and, and what you get from batteries, again, is it allows you to remove the pe peaks and the troughs. So, you know, if you have spikes that you might have a very, you know, a very like a long winter period with, uh, you know, like less, you know, less, less generation available, um, or you might have just short inputs of you know, very, very um, high, high demand, I guess, like today, because ironically, there's, a, you know, even though it's not lovely and sunny, that people will put a lot of cooling on. Batteries allow you to very quickly give those high, high impacts um, without necessarily building additional capacity, because you're just basically smoothing what you have. So, um, I mean, the, the challenge is just, is, is enormous. Um, the, the, the fact that this is, has to happen within 30 years, and actually clearly well before 30 years, if you come back to my original you know, not my original points, but the, you know, the, the position where we are of keeping temperatures at one and a half degrees C of warming. Um, we're, we're, you know, it would be great, I, I think, to be, you know, at the point where we've installed so much solar and renewable capacity that we, we think we've probably got enough. I'd be delighted. I'd, I'd probably hang out my boots. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think we're a very long way away from that at the moment. Um, but we're certainly doing everything we can to, to, to get there. Yeah, so I can't see traffic volume reducing significantly in the short term either. Yeah. Even during lockdown, we seem to still have gridlock all over South London. Sure. Um, here's one. If electric vehicles were to take longer than expected become, to become mainstream, because, you know, strange events do sometimes happen in the world, um, can these projects still repay capital? Yeah, th this, is, this is the point that I, I kind of touched on, which is that, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've been driving an EV now for uh, nearly seven years. And, um, and so I've kind of gone from, you know, zero in the most basic you know, EV models compared to what we have now. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and over that period of time, um, I have, um, you know, it was very clear to me that this is going to become mainstream. But having not gone through that journey, um, it was a lot harder a few years ago to convince people that actually what's going to ha what's happening now in the EV kind of transition to mainstream is actually going to happen across the board. And so when we started designing the infrastructure that we're designing, we actually started it from the perspective of, well, okay, people, you know, we, we feel it's going to happen. We're just not quite sure when. Um, and therefore, what about how does, you know, how do people make money in the, in the traditional petrol forecourt business? And actually, we learned that actually most of the money is made from the retail and other solutions. When you also add a big battery to a grid connection, you can then make additional income. Um, and, uh, and actually, so we ended up building a combination of, of revenue streams, which would allow people to get comfortable that the, you know, even if the take up was much slower. H having said all of that, the, the world has changed dramatically in the last 12 to 24 months. And, uh, and, and nobody really, um, are, you know, is asking that question anymore of, if, is it going to happen? It's just, you know, how quickly um, and are we ready for the speed that it's happening at? You know, there was a recent article that came out from Bloomberg that basically said this infrastructure is now profitable in, its, in itself, which we thought was you know, very interesting. So we've prepared ourselves for that and that's put us in really good shape to be, uh, to be able to provide a buffer. Um, but having said that, the world is moving so quickly and, and now with all of the auto manufacturers you know, focusing on electric vehicles and European legislation forcing them to, um, you know, as we say, we, we really do think 2021 uh, is where it's going to, well, 
it's not us thinking this is this is this is what's happening um uh you know effectively from now but 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 hereafter right interesting and how practical do you think it is to use existing real estate to generate and supply solar energy for example using retail car yeah so this is this comes back to that slide um about where people charge their vehicles so um what what people what we need to do is we need to basically make the the overall experience for electric vehicle drivers um just absolutely brilliant um because the cars are absolutely brilliant the vehicles are fantastic but the charging experience has you know at the moment quite a lot to be desired um but it's being very fixed very quickly that means if you've got the ability to charge at home you want to provide a solution which makes it great um similarly if you're going to a retail park and you're going to be there for like i don't know an hour half an hour however long it might be then you want to make sure that you've got charging infrastructure that when you turn up it's it's available you're not having to worry that there's only one or two charges and you can't charge um, but also that when you come back to your vehicle, having spent the, the right time that you would typically spend in such an environment, that you put a meaningful amount of charge into your vehicle or you won't bother using it at all. Um, so it's really about horses for courses. You know, we, we, we call that infrastructure destination charges, because if you're going to your, your, your retail park uh, and that's your principal reason, you want a, a charger that matches that destination. Um, and that's, you know, that's very important as well. I mean, we as an organization are actually doing all of these, these different solutions. Um, but it also doesn't, doesn't negate the need for... Uh, the destination in itself, you know, i.e. somebody turning up because they just need to charge their vehicle and, uh, and they need to do it quickly and it needs to be a good environment. And, uh, you know, and that's also clearly a big part of it, but both in people's use of that in the future, but also in providing people the confidence to actually finally make the move. Really good. We have time for just one more question. Um, how practical is it? Sorry, oops, that was the question. We probably have some knowledge of cars and the need for infrastructure to support electrification. Can you say something about road haulage and you know, sort of these 44 ton juggernauts and, and how are they going to work vis-a-vis -vis electrification? Yeah, just, just jumping on that as well. So um, a few years ago, people perceived, and I saw another couple of questions, also one on hydrogen, maybe I can loop that in. A few years ago, people perceived that you'd never, you know, battery vehicles wouldn't really work um, for anything bigger than a, a small vehicle, um, that's basically blown out the water. Now, um, it's not just about cars, it's about, uh, it's effectively all road transport um, is becoming electrified because the economics just make you know, in incredible sense, i.e. it's less expensive um, to run these vehicles over their life, over their life cycle than, than conventional alternatives. One of the issues with hydrogen, and I, I learned this the hard way, um, I, I built a hydrogen business many years ago, is that the economics of hydrogen are just so, much more expensive, let alone the complex complexity of dealing with hydrogen gas, that whilst you can make it work, if you have an alternative of harvesting energy from, from the sun, which is basically available everywhere, and using it in a battery without having to deal with gases or complexity, it, it's just so much straight, more straightforward. And so, you know, Tesla's bringing out, you know, large, uh, large articulated, uh, you know, articulated electric vehicle, particularly lorry alternative, so are many others. And so, really you know road transport um is, is absolutely going to be electric really okay well thank you for that that's all we have time for however mark and toddington have kindly agreed to answer some of the additional questions we'll be answering the answer we'll be adding those answers to the webinar page soon and let you know that they're online um many many thanks to toddington and mark for joining us today and a big thank you to say, if i can say rachel thank you so much everybody if anyone has any questions i've seen that we have may not have answered all of them very happy to, to reach out directly and, and, to, and answer them thank you very much everybody okay great so we hope to see you again soon and bye for now thank you thank you